Hello everyone and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and analyst, Dave Vellante. We, John Furrier is also here with us this week. Um, but I'd like to introduce our first guest of the day of the show. He is Greg Ernst, Corporate Vice President, Intel Sales and Marketing and GM America Sales at Intel. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. Thank you, thank you Rebecca. It's exciting to be here and uh, congrats for all your success. This is always the highlight of the big shows around the world. Thank you, thanks for your support. We appreciate yeah, uh, Intel you, coming Dave. on over the years. Done a lot with you guys, so yeah. thank you Dave. So all three of us are fresh from the keynote yeah. in the sphere, the first ever keynote to, to take place in the sphere. We just heard Antonio Neri, Jensen Huang, both of them were talking about how we are really on the cusp of a major societal, technological transformation yeah. with AI. I'm curious if you want to start talking a little bit, Greg, about from Intel's perspective, yeah. where we are in terms of this inflection point for, for businesses that are looking to, to, to get going with AI. Yeah, no, thank you, Rebecca. And how cool was it? The, it was, the visual it was optics awesome. were impressive. It was my first time in the sphere, so. Uh, that, uh, I know we were all buzzing to get in there and, 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 and check it out. Uh, but from Intel's point of view, our really our mission is, as a company, and we're going to build on decades of what we've done, is make implementing AI into the enterprise workflows easier. And that, to me, is uh, um, that's what we wake up every day doing, was right, how do we work with standard bodies, how do we work with the ISV community that we've always been known for? I mean, as you know, like Pat used to work at VMware, so that's close to our heart. Uh, how do we work with the OEMs? And, and what ecosystems do we create? So for, and I'm excited to unpack some of those things, because Intel ourselves, we've had really huge announcements the last six, seven weeks that documenting that progress that we're doing together with the industry to make it easier. Um, but the potential of, AI is incredible, and, and every company is on a different stage of the journey. Some are really out in front, uh, and others want to really just kind of be, learn and be measured in their progress. Uh, I've said most of the clients I've talked to, they've implemented a few workflows consistently on the enterprise side. One, just being advanced search, uh, that whether that's for external or internal, really all being able to make that content much more searchable. Uh, help desk would be number two, and then uh, software code generation, number three. But eventually at Intel, we believe in this AI continuum where every persona type and every vertical, there'll be dedicated AI workflows, and frankly, it'll be required for companies to do it in order to stay competitive in their industry. And, and the market, I, it's almost like you can't even size it, Greg. Yeah. It's just enormous. And so, to your point, Intel building upon its decades of ecosystem yeah. enablement, that's one of the hallmarks, uh, then this AI wave comes along. It's not like you didn't know machine learning and AI, but yeah. the vast majority of the customers weren't you know, focused on it. Now, 100% right. are. And Intel, what Intel's trying to do is unprecedented. Um, both the shift in, you know, toward AI, the foundry initiatives, uh, yeah. the global build out, that Pat's on a mission yeah. to, to educate people on the importance of, 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 of really hardening the supply chain. Uh, so you got a lot going on. Yeah. Um, and so, how, what's it like inside of Intel and, and the, the transformation that you're yeah. going through now? It's torrid. That's a word that we've Store. been using the last three years, torrid. Uh, the pace is incredible and and Intel, we recognize the huge responsibility that we have um, because there's two counter forces that are really working. There's one, this incredible applications for compute, which requires incredible power and compute build out. But then there's also our responsibility around sustainability for the globe. And at Intel, we, we participate in both. We're actually probably the only company that at scale produces customized compute for AI as well as the foundry element. Um, and so for us, it's, it's every, every company is a customer. 
And even some of these, uh, or target customer at least, so even some of these uh, companies that you would think traditionally are a competitor in Intel's, we're actually becoming a partner and, and, and working and making our fabs available to them for the build out. Uh, and I'm super proud, everyone at Intel, we are proud of what we have done where we've built not just a globally diverse, resilient supply chain, but very sustainable. Uh, almost all of our factories return more water to the earth than we take out. Almost all of our factories are powered with renewable energy. So any, every company that's really focused at scope one, two, and three, uh, Intel's a key partner for that because we, we are the only foundry where that has become a foundation. Renewable energy, returning more water to the Earth's surface than we take out. So as the world demands this compute, we're, we're proud to be able to supply it. And then of course, we have this you know, big you know, $60 billion business where we produce our own semiconductors with the Intel brand and we sell into enterprises all over the world. Yeah, so the scope, I'm not really deep into the the, the scope three piece, but it's, yeah. I'm inferring from what you said that a part of that is your supply chain has yeah. to be s scope three. You know, nobody really is there yet, but we're all right. working toward that. So that's a key part of it. It's not just what you do, it's what you do, what you do for your customer, all the way back to the value yeah. chain. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the two of them combined, and we did recognize, as you, as you said, Dave, it's the, I mean, AI is, been on a, a, a rapid ascension the last several years. We have edge inference being huge. A lot of the cloud service providers were using it for uh, better uh, search and recommendation engines. And then clearly like November, when uh, the Gen AI explosion happened, it's taken everything to a whole whole different world, as, whole different level. As you're saying, you get your fingers in a lot of pies. Um, the core, let's, let's come back to Xeon a little bit. Yeah. Give us the update on Xeon 5, Xeon 6, you have yeah. Xeon 6 News. Yeah. I'd love to get into so the futures yeah. there. Thank you. you for, it's, as I said earlier, Torrid has been the, I've, the adverb at Intel. We've been, uh, we've been busy, and, and we really just fundamentally, uh, what drives our company is Moore's Law. And I know there's all sorts of people speculating is Moore's Law dead or not, but, but one of the things that we're really proud of as a company in the last uh, four years is we've done five manufacturing transitions. Uh, so each one of those transitions, we, we increase the transistor density, which again, more compute, less power. Uh, typically, under Moore's Law, you would do one every 18 months to two years. We've done five and four. But then, we don't just do it for the physics, we actually build products at scale on each one. And as you said, we've, we announced Xeon 5 just six months ago. We're in high production, we're shipping millions of units. And then at Computex two weeks ago, we announced Xeon 6, which is that next generation, and both both families integrate uh, advanced matrix uh, software into it, so it's AI accelerator built into Xeon. Uh, we have one family is focused at these high performance cores, the other one is per energy efficient cores that are wonderful for uh, any application that was written cloud, cloud first. So we've, we've been busy, and uh, but Great partners like HPE are keeping uh, keeping pace with us and rolling out. Like for in the, in the case of HPE, their their HPE uh, ProLiant D380 will support both families. So I, I want to, if I may, yeah. I just want to yeah. follow up on some of the things Greg said. So you have five nodes in four four years. Pat has I think said that thousands of times. Yeah. And, and when I first heard it, I was like. No way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually doing it. Because I mean, yeah. time to tape out has historically been yeah. a couple of years. So five nodes in four years, again, unprecedented. What's, uh, what's interesting to me, you mentioned Torrid a couple times. Yeah. Intel was always the conservative one. And now you're like doing things that, I, I, if you pull this off, this is like, you get goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah. It'd be like near miracle, because you got backside power, you got gate all around, you're doing, NAEUV all at once. I mean, it's never been even contemplated before. Yeah. And so, you know, everybody's of course rooting for Intel, 
the, it's going to be mind blowing to see how this yeah. all plays out. And it doesn't happen overnight, obviously. But the focus is is it's a new, it's a renewed focus at the company. It's very clear. So it's a renewed focus. It's a hard work of a hundred thousand people. And what we wake up every day is really just how do we stretch the laws of physics? And that that and that especially now in a world where compute demand is insatiable, that translates into power uh, and performance, which is, you know, is, is critical in these big data centers where power is actually the limiting factor. Uh, so driving that Moore's Law, is, it's a company-wide effort, and, um, and I'm just honored to play a small, small role, which is, bringing it to market. And they're, they're doing some wild things with packaging. Like I mentioned, I'm not an expert on this, but backside power means you can put you know, more transistors on the front side and it's, it's, it's more power efficient and the numbers are just, they're, they're mind blowing. Yeah. Again, what you're trying to do. Um, I'm impressed you know the backside power. I mean, it is the yeah. future. I mean, yeah. it's like the future of packaging. And, yeah. But, uh, well, what we, <laughs> yeah, maybe I explain for the audience. Yeah. So what we've done um, for, for decades, a wafer had uh, the power delivery, so all the routing, all the wiring, and the transistors on the same side of the wafer. The problem with that is the current's got to travel a longer distance. So what does that do? That burns power, creates heat. So what our engineers at Intel came up with is a novel way, which is transistors on one side, power in the routing on the top side, now the challenge for that is you can only print on one side at a time. So we print on one side of the wafer, you have to flip it, get it perfectly aligned with billions of transistors and do it a second time. That's why no, no one else has ever done it before because of the complexity of that. And the great news is, is it's done, it's proven, and we're going to be shipping products with it. And what this allows, if I understand it, the EDA vendors who's shipping you know, software to you know, help yeah. you get actually lay down transistors, actually now have greater flexibility and they can do yeah. some amazing things. But it's not just, what do you guys call it? Ribbon FET, I think is your Yeah, term. ribbon FET for I'm the using, transistor. So not only backside power, you're bringing ribbon FET, call it gate all around, which is just, Intel introduced FinFET years ago. And this thing, you guys just took shipments from the ASML NAEUV machine. Yeah. I don't really understand it. How this is going to work, but it's like magic that somehow you lay down this polymer, yeah. and then it lays down the transistors, but you can use the NAEUV to guide the organic laying down of the, the it's just, yeah. I, again, I don't really understand it, but that's why I'm saying it. You could pull this off. This is like literally a miracle that Gelsinger and, and Intel are trying it to achieve. A, yeah. And so, again, I mean, I view it's we've pulled it off, right? So it's customers' orders are coming in, and, and our engineers have done it. It's well, all three have that. to come together with 14A. That's what I'm watching. Okay. Which I think is 2027. That's the sixth that? node. So, that's, that's yeah, like, we've done five and four. Okay. You're already pushing me, Greg. When's well, the sixth only one? Because that's like, Intel does that. It's like, game over. They wake yeah, up every like, morning <laughs> stretching the laws of physics. Yeah, we just we heard too. this from Greg. Yeah, Greg, too. can you talk a little bit more about this AI continuum that you talked yeah. about? Because I think that it will, it will help, as you said earlier, yeah. every customer is at a different stage in their AI journey. Right. So can you sort of walk us through how, how Intel views this yeah. continuum? Yeah, no, thank you, Rebecca. I would, um, one of the things, we always challenge ourselves to do more. Uh, but one of the things that we recognized is uh, one of the, the great things that the industry has created is this x86 software instruction set. And that allows uh, developers to write, whether it's for uh, PC, CPUs, Edge, data center, really leverage that x86 architecture. So what we recognized as a company uh, several years ago is we're going to build on top of that with with AI accelerators into each one of our product lines. So that's our piece, so whether it's PC, Edge, Xeon, now each product has a built-in AI accelerator. Everything we launch in 25 has a, in 24 has a. Uh, I think that's important as you look at it for customers because uh, I would say almost every enterprise company right now, they have a, a team, a centralized team inside their company that's really focused on which, what, what are the AI use cases that they're going to bring to provide benefits to their employees. 
right? Um, now for us, some of those large language models need to run on a private PC. So that's what our core ultra products do that we launched a few months ago. Uh, some need to run in public cloud, and then some are private LLMs that are going to run on, on the data center. But the good news for us and, and for our clients is there's AI acceleration at each step. So they don't actually, they can choose what's best for their company aligned to their AI policies and beliefs. Uh, and they're not limited by the technology. Uh, the technology is there for them regardless of where their data resides and how they want to or orchestrate these LLMs. So for us, that's how we, uh, when I think AI continuum, Rebecca, that, that to me is what I'm saying. So thanks for letting me expand on it. Do you think AI, Greg, will compress the life cycles, it's not a PC show here, but PCs yeah. we can all relate to, but also of servers. Every cloud vendor has, you look at their 10Ks, uh, they've restated their depreciation schedule to, I think it's now six years. Right. What that does, just makes the income statement look better, which is okay, that's fine, but, and that's part of why they do it, but it's also, they're, servers are lasting longer, right? You can, you can yeah. squeeze more of them. Same thing with PCs, same thing with yeah. our phones. Do you think AI is going to change that and compress that, those cycles? Compress it back down less than six? Yeah. Uh, I think so, for sure. As long as companies like Intel and then NVIDIA, if we're doing one to two launches every year, then eventually the power it takes to operate a system three to four years ago, it's not just not the power, it's, it's not worth paying that, that electricity bill when the performance per watt is, is skyrocketing so fast. Um, but, but then I think there's also, and this is one of the beauties of our product line at Intel, is we have general purpose CPUs and then we have dedicated accelerators. One of the things I, I, I believe is with proper uh, infrastructure management, the server could still be useful, a three, four, five-year-old server could still be useful, uh, but probably for a different workload. You're not going to use it for training and fine-tuning your latest LLM, something that's four or five years ago, but you may still be able to run a lot of your enterprise apps and be able to continue to, to eke out the benefits. So, right. But I, I agree with you, I think the, the job of an infrastructure lifecycle manager is going to change a lot. So today's training yeah. server maybe becomes tomorrow's inference server, something yeah. like that. I, I think so, and that, that's been a big part of, I'd say, a lot of the conversation that we had with clients is just around managing the cost, and that's part of, a big part of the conversation we're having with them is it's, um, don't be so enamored on just one workload that you forget on the kind of the continuum of the applications that they're going to need to run. Yeah. Exactly, well that's great advice. And yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Greg, a pleasure having you on theCUBE. Well thank you. Very exciting. I, my honor to represent Intel on the, as the first guest of the show, so thank you. Indeed. I know we were geeking out there a little bit, but that was, that was fun, thank you. <laughs> Dave likes backside power. <laughs> that's your jam, I, I get it, I get it. Yeah. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.